Um, welcome everyone, my name is Josh. Um, I have the pleasure of leading us into worship today. Um, if you're able, please rise for the call to worship. Our call to worship comes from Psalms 145 verses 1 through 3. Um, if you could just listen while I, I read um, this passage for us. I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his grace.
find me now where the grace runs as deep as your scars you pull me from the clay set me on a rock call me by your name made my heart whole again lift it up it's all for your glory. I might stand with more reasons to sing than to fear. You pull me from the clay, send me on a rock, call me by your name. Grace is not just a one-time experience, but it is an ongoing gift that God offers us uh, day in and day out. And every week and every moment, he offers us his grace. And in this time where we confess and where we hear the words of assurance, it's an important reminder that it is ultimately grace that allows us to be here in this space. God is the one that first pursued us and moved towards us in love. He breaks that ice so that we can have confidence to then now boldly approach him. You know, but as his children, as we get to know our father's heart, uh, we can't help but feel inadequate because our father, he is, he is perfect. He is holy in every way. 
And so we do things that we ought not. And we failed, fail to do things that he calls us to do. And this is a struggle for all of us. And so confession is an opportunity for us to bring all our sins, our brokenness, and our failures before him. And the promise is that if we do, that he is faithful to forgive us. And so God desires us for us to run to him in our brokenness. And so in this time of confession, I want to invite us to do that now. Let's confess our sins in silence at this time. Now receive the words of assurance from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is a spirit. Amen. Jesus has removed the very barrier that stood in the way for us to have intimacy with our Father. He has paid the penalty of our sin. And so there is this profound freedom where we can now just be with Him and rest in Him. If you're able, if you can stand with me at this time as we confess our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed. You know, these creeds are a summary of uh, what Christians have believed for centuries. And this creed reminds us of the truth and hope we have in the gospel. So let's read this together in one voice. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's respond and worship together.
Jesus, your presence is a comfort of my soul. There's nowhere I'd rather be than your singing over me. I just Um, Esther for some announcements. Good morning, citizens, and happy Sunday. Uh, my name is Esther, and I oversee city partnerships here. Um, and I just wanted to say that I'm so happy to see all of you, um, for those that are joining here with us right now in person, but also those that will be joining us online later this evening. And I especially wanted to um, welcome any of you that are here for the very, very first time. We are so glad that you have decided to worship with us today. Um, we'd love to get to know you, so after service, um, you can come up to me or any of our other staff. Um, or even any of our volunteers. Um, we'd love for you to get connected to our community. Um, but before we invite Jason up to bring us God's word, I do have some announcements for us today. Um, we have quite a few, so please uh, bear with me. They are all very, very important announcements. Um, so as many of you know, through the month of May, we are continuing, continuing to support our friends at Lincoln Heights. Uh, tutorial program for their Give in May campaign where they are raising funds for the many different programs they have throughout the year. 
Um, Dennis and Trin, who now attend our church, have been doing such incredible work uh, with the students of their program for the last 30 years. Um, we're really excited to continue supporting them through various events. And um, if you are feeling led to give, we'll be showing a QR code at the end of the um, announcements. Our next announcement is for all of our newcomers. Um, there will be a lunch that will be happening next Sunday after service, May 29th. Um, this is something that's new for us as citizens, and we're hoping to do it every last Sunday of the month. Um, being new to a church can feel overwhelming, and it can be difficult to find people to connect with. So we're hoping that these lunches can give us all an opportunity to meet one another and grab a delicious meal together after service. So anyone who wants to join are welcome, but we especially hope that if you are new, that you would join us. Um, so next Sunday, we will have um, someone outside with a newcomer's lunch sign, and then we'll all decide together where we'll be heading um, for lunch. Um, next is a really, really special um, opportunity that we have coming up. One of our members named Candy Chung is on the board for a nonprofit called Minds Matter. And Minds Matter is a nonprofit tutoring and mentoring program for driven and determined high school students living in low income and undervalued communities across Los Angeles and Orange County. Um, so specifically, on uh, May, or sorry, on June 12th, right after service, it'll actually be right here, so it'll be super easy. Um, we're gonna be actually making some like swag bags um, for students that are participating in their upcoming career incubator. Um, it's an annual event uh, where we invite panelists from different careers um, that these students otherwise would not have been exposed to to discuss topics such as their career path, day in the life, et cetera as well as how diversity, equity, and inclusion is like in the workplace and industry. So if you guys are interested, uh, please join us. We're just gonna kind of like set up an assembly line here and create the swag bags. You don't need to bring anything, just, um, you just need to show up. Lunch will be provided, um, but we do need you guys to RSVP, so you can also RSVP through the QR code or the link on our website. Um, and lastly, we have our upcoming congregational meeting that will be taking place on June 12th at 8 p.m. on Zoom. We will be hearing from the finance team as well with, as Jason um, uh, on various different ministry updates. Uh, we will also be voting on the budget for the upcoming fiscal year. So anyone is welcome to join, um, but only members would be allowed to vote on the budget. Um, so that's all we have for announcements. You can sign up for any of the events that I talked about by scanning the QR code on the screen or by clicking the link in the bio of our Instagram page. Um, and before we invite Jason up to give us the word, we'll be going into a time of offering. We believe that giving is an act of worship. And if you're new to citizens or visiting for the very first time, uh, please don't feel pressured in any way to give. But if you call citizens your home, we do encourage you to give with grateful hearts. Uh, you'll see a number you can text on the screen, and if you're joining us online, you can click on the link that you'll see in our caption to our giving page. So please take the next few moments to do that as we invite Jason to give today's word to us. All right. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Citizens. My name is Jason. I serve as a pastor here at the church. Uh, so good to see uh, so many of you here today, um, especially if you're new. Again, really want to welcome you. We know uh, sometimes the church can feel a little bit overwhelming. Um, and so if you want to get plugged in or get connected, um, would love to get to know you. Usually I'm hanging out around outside somewhere near the info table where there's coffee and so um, would love to get to know you and help you get plugged in and answer any questions that you have about the church uh, before we get into the word um, I do want to you know man I just feel like every week we're coming up here and sometimes talking about like bad news and you know as you know last week we took some time in our service to pray for uh, everything that happened in Buffalo and in Dallas and you know, right after church, I got home to a whole bunch of text messages um, about uh, the shooting that happened in Laguna Woods. 
um, California. And that one obviously just hits uh, even closer to home, not just because of proximity, um, but also because, you know, as an Asian American, um, just to see like uh, basically a hate crime among Asian Americans, um, there's something just like really visceral about that. And, you know, I was on a Zoom chat with some pastors this week, uh, pastors who are connected to the Taiwanese uh, Presbyterian Church there. And um, it's just, you know, I think ac across the country right now, um, our Taiwanese Christian brothers and sisters don't know what to do. Um, this is kind of something that's unprecedented. Um, they're talking about armed security at all of their churches now. Um, there are elderly thinking about getting guns, and it's just something that I, I feel like is, um, yeah, it's just so sad um, to hear stories like this. And, you know, do want to take a moment um, in our service today to lift them up in prayer. Um, you know, I think, especially as someone who grew up in a Korean American church that always ate lunch as a community after church every Sunday, um, to know that someone walked in during their lunch fellowship and started shooting. I mean, that just hits so close to home. And so, um, you know, um, this week I was kind of um, looking at a whole bunch of different prayers um, from some people I respect greatly. And this prayer by Reverend Terry McDowell Ott just uh, spoke to me, resonated with me. So I'm going to invite us to bow our heads. Um, and let's take a moment to pray uh, for Irvine, uh, Irvine Taiwanese Presbyterian Church, as well as just the broader Taiwanese American Christian community. God of grace, we lament the violence. For those who have no words, those holding themselves, rocking with each wave of grief, those planting both feet, seeking balance in crisis and chaos, those who moan, weep, and wail the names of their dead. Those sitting silently in front of their screens, sickened by the shootings, by the innocent lives lost, by the hatred that fuels such violence. We pray, O oh God. We pray for the victims in Laguna Woods, California. We pray for those terrorized and traumatized by horrific shootings. We lament for the lessons the shootings teach us over and over about the brokenness of our humanity and the hatred that has been undeniable and unrelenting. We pray for the people who pay the price for that hatred, day after day, year after year, century after century. We pray for our Taiwanese siblings in California targeted during the violence at Geneva Presbyterian Church. We pray that your people find comfort in your saving grace. Our land is troubled and our peace disturbed. God of love and life, Guide us by your truth. Bend the arc of the universe toward justice. Inspire us with courage to resist the evil of racism, to proclaim your inclusive love, to root out the enemies of righteousness, to persist for peace. Let nothing move us from your path of love, blessed God. Let nothing sway our confidence that you are with us. Turn our eyes to Christ and the promise of our redemption. Amen. 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 Uh, well, I have the privilege, as always, of bringing us God's word. Um, our word today comes from John 15. Uh, you're going to see it on the screen behind me, but if you want to follow along on your phone or in a physical Bible, uh, John 15, we're reading the ESV, so the English Standard Version, and I'm just going to read verses 1 to 11. John chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. This is the reading of God's word. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 
By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, today uh, I'm excited to be launching a new sermon series at our church, and we're calling this series The Church We Long For. And um, as you know, there have been a steady stream of newcomers uh, checking out Citizens uh, these past few months. Maybe it's your first time checking out the church. And um, a phrase I've been hearing a lot is, I'm looking for a church that does X, Y, and Z. Or I'm looking for a church that has a certain kind of vibe or a certain kind of preaching or a certain kind of music. Uh, or, or speaks to a certain kind of age demographic or has uh, specific children's programs. And, and you realize as you talk to different people how different our expectations are of what the church is and what the church should be. And I think oftentimes these expectations shape our experience of a church. Um, more often than not, they determine whether we choose to stay or leave a church. Um, and while I think sometimes these expectations can be a little bit idealistic or even misguided, um, I do think they speak to something deeper that all of us are long, longing for. You know, I think we can all agree that we're all looking for a community where every person is seen, known, and valued. I think we can all agree that every person here wants a community where people genuinely love Jesus. A community that looks after the forgotten and the marginalized, a community that places the needs of others before themselves. And I think on one hand, you think, isn't this what all churches should look like? But I think if we're honest, so much of our experience has not shown that to be the case. And so we want to do this series not necessarily because we believe that citizens possesses some kind of secret sauce or because we believe we've done this perfectly, uh, but more so as a way for us to keep ourselves accountable in this season of change and growth, for us to say, this is the kind of church we're committed to becoming. That Jesus had something very specific in mind when he established his church, and that's the church we want to be. And ultimately, I believe that that church is the church all of us are deeply longing for. You know, I believe that, um, you know, what Jesus had in mind was certainly not a social club, what Jesus had in mind was certainly not a one-hour event on Sunday morning. It wasn't Christian hinge. Okay, what Jesus had in mind was something completely radical and countercultural. And I believe that this is a defining moment right now for the Capital C Church. You know, if you study church history, there are these pivotal moments that really shake Christianity to the core that really kind of alter the trajectory of the church altogether. And, you know, you may disagree with me here, but I believe we're living in one of those moments. I believe this is a defining moment for the church because you had a pandemic that basically was a huge reset button on the church that wiped out all of our preconceived notions about what church should look like. You know, the Sunday event was gone. The building was gone. In-person social gatherings, gone. And if this, this was all church was to you, then it's no wonder that all the most recent statistics and a most recent study done by Barna, it showed that during the pandemic, one in three practicing Christians dropped out of the church altogether. One in three. And right now, um, as I look at the landscape of churches, you know, uh, as I talk to different pastors, I realize that so many churches are, tr are asking the question, what innovative strategies can we use to get people back in the church, to get people back in the building? And I, I don't want to ask that question. The question I'd like to pose with this series is, what can we do to look more like the church Jesus intended us to be? How can we become the church Jesus intended us to be, because I believe that church is the church all of us are longing for. And I want to start today by talking about what I personally believe is the hallmark of the church we all long for, and that's a church that abides. A church that abides. If you're taking notes, that's the title of the sermon, The Church That Abides. Uh, this passage in John 15 is one of my all-time favorite passages in Scripture, and to give us a little bit of context, John 15 occurs in the middle of what is commonly referred to as Jesus' farewell discourse. Okay, it's Jesus saying goodbye. 
Um, you know, he's just finished his last meal with his disciples, and he knows it's only a matter of time before he's going to be taken away and brutally executed on a cross. And you know that when a person uh, knows that he or she is going to die very soon, I mean, their words just carry that much more weight. Because you know that everything they say is said knowing that they don't have much time left with the people they love. And so it's very telling what Jesus chooses to say to his disciples with his final words. He doesn't give them a list of do's and don'ts. He doesn't give them all the answers to their most burning theological questions. He doesn't tell them how to vote or who to marry. Jesus says, abide in me. Abide in me. In fact, that word abide translated from the Greek word meno is used 10 times in these 11 verses. 10 times. So you probably should pay attention. And that word basically means to remain, to stay, to loiter, to hang out and make yourself at home. Jesus is saying to his disciples, look, I know there's a lot you don't understand right now. I know you have a lot of questions. I know the world out there is a scary place. I know you're not sure if you can find a job in this economy. I know, I know your life is not turning out the way you scripted it, but abide in me. Stay with me. Find your home in me. Because what Jesus is getting at is that who you are connected to will determine the quality and trajectory of your life. Who you are connected to will determine the quality of your life. You know, Harvard University, they published a study in 2017, and they started this study in 1938, okay? So it's like a pretty long study. By the end of the study, I think only like 19 of the original participants were still alive, okay? And it was like an 80-year study where they followed 268 sophomores from graduation to the end of their lives because they were trying to understand how early childhood experiences uh, impact someone's uh, overall health and their aging over time. And so as the study went on, it went on to include the original participants' kids and their grandkids. So it got really big. And, and as the study went on, they realized something, right? They started to learn all these different things, and they realized, huh, contrary to popular belief, a person's early childhood actually didn't have as large of an impact on their overall health and aging as they thought it would. Neither did genetics, neither did social class, neither did IQ. But the single most important factor affecting a person's health and aging over time was their close relationships. It was their close relationships. The people who were most satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were consistently the healthiest at age 80. Physical health, emotional health, mental health. And the implication here is that who you hang out with determines the quality of your life. Who you hang out with determines the quality of your life. And this is what Jesus is getting at. He's saying, if you want to live life to the full, it's not about how smart you are. It's not about how successful you are, how many kids you have, what your portfolio looks like. If you want to live life to the full, you have to hang out with me. You have to abide. Now, keep in mind, this passage is not about getting saved because in verse 3, Jesus says, already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. The disciples are already following Jesus, okay? Getting saved is not the issue here. This passage is not about becoming a disciple. It's about being transformed as a disciple. It's about growing and maturing in the character of Christ. Everyone here who's married knows that it's one thing to be married. It's another thing to have a healthy marriage to be growing and maturing as a spouse. It's one thing to identify as a Christian. It's a completely different thing to live into that identity. You know, sometimes I go on Twitter uh, and and I go on a thread and I'll see like the most like hateful comment ever. Like it's like so outrageous. So obviously, you know, I'll click on that person. And then, um, you know, my favorite thing that happens is that when I click on that person in their bio, it's like Philippians 2 with a cross emoji, right? It's like husband, father, lover of Christ, right? And, And you realize, like, man, like, you can identify as a Christian and yet have your life look nothing like Christ. And Jesus is saying, if you want to look like me, 
you have to abide in me. And he uses this beautiful metaphor of branches abiding in a vine to communicate what this looks like. It looks like unbroken connection and dependence. As many of you know, a branch cannot survive apart from the vine. And so when Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches, he's saying, you can't survive apart from me. You can't just visit me once a week for an hour and expect to be healthy. You can't just drop in here and there once in a while and expect to be healthy. You have to be connected to the vine. You know, we live in L.A. where everyone's on a diet, right? You know, I mean, I have friends. Every, every week is a different diet, like keto, South Beach, Atkins, Whole30, all, all of it. You name it, right? And, you know, like I'm guilty of this too. Sometimes I go out to eat and, that, you know, I'll order a salad. And I'll be like, you know what, I'm going to be healthy, Right? always the worst meal of my life and um, it's funny that you think that like ordering a salad once a week can make a person healthy everyone here knows it doesn't you have to adopt the lifestyle and yet for some reason when it comes to our spiritual lives and we come to church and we say I don't know why it's not a transformative experience for me this one hour a week does nothing for me the question is is this just your salad? Or are we abiding in the vine? Because Jesus says a branch that is disconnected from the vine will wither and die. In verse 6, he says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. They're as good as dead. Well, what does this mean then? You know, and I think it's easy to read a passage like this to say like, well, does this mean that like every waking moment I have to spend at church? You know, I got to like sing praise songs at work and like, you know, I can carry around my Bible and pray all the time. You know, and I think that's like, you know, obviously don't do that because that's weird, right? I mean, but I think that's often what we think, the image that comes to mind when we think abide, right? You know, I remember growing up in youth group and you know, the worship leader, like, last night of the retreat, everyone's crying, right? Everyone always cries the last night of the retreat. And I remember, like, you know, it would be, like, 3 in the morning. We're still praising. And the worship leader would be like, and guess what? We're going to be doing this for all of eternity. And I would be like, oh, man, but I don't know if I, I like that, you know? It's like, I love singing and I love praise, but, like, I mean, like, are we going to eat sometimes? And, like, you know, can we do something different? And I think when we think of like abiding and staying connected to the vine, like this is the image we have, doing churchy things, doing spiritual things, doing things that feel like they're godly. And I think too often we've confused doing things for God and knowing a lot about God to actually being with God. You know, you can know a lot about a person now just by stalking them on social media. You can know a lot about a person by Googling them. You know, there's actually quite a bit of information on the internet. But you can't really know a person until you spend time with that person. I can do a lot of things for you, but I can't really know you unless I'm actually spending time with you. Right? Many of us grew up in homes where our parents did so much for us, but never hung out with us, right? And, I, you know, obviously, this is at no fault to them. Many of our parents were immigrants, came here from a different country without knowing the language or the culture, I and mean, they were just trying to survive. They were just trying to put food on the table. Right? But I think oftentimes they got it confused that just because they were doing so much for us, they equated loving their children with doing things for them, but often rarely being with them. I know that so many of us in here have had that conversation with our parents where they've said, do you know how much I've done for you? Do you know what I've sacrificed so that we could live in this home, in this city, so that you could go to this school? How dare you say I don't love you? To which many of us responded, but all I wanted was some time with you. And I think even in our generation of parents, we're guilty of the same things. 
we often equate doing for as being the same as being with. And sometimes I realize how much that paradigm has shaped our relationship with God. We often think that doing things for God is the same as being with God. Um, in his chapter in the book, Intersecting Realities, uh, Daniel Lee, who's actually a member of our community, so it's really cool when I get to quote someone who actually comes to our church, but he says something really interesting, and I'm going to put it on the screen above, uh, behind me. He says, so often we confuse godliness with God. The point of spiritual practices is to open ourselves up to God's presence, encountering God in and through these acts. In other words, they are tools, a means to an end. They are not meaningful in and of themselves because then they can become idols replacing God. Without this reminder, these practices can become terrible tyrants oppressing us with their demands of spiritual performance. This is why church, ironically, can be a perfect place to miss God. Why? Because there are so many spiritual, godly activities in church that we can so easily substitute for God. We can actually miss the living God and get sidetracked by godliness. Wow. I mean, I think that's many of our experiences. Now, I want, to ask, I want you to ask yourself this question. What would being a Christian mean to you without your spiritual churchy activities? What would being a Christian mean to you without coming to church on Sunday, going out to a small group, reading your Bible, praying, serving? What would being a Christian mean to you without all the doing? I have to ask myself that all the time because I'm a pastor. So being a Christian is in my job description. But what would being a Christian mean to you without all the doing? Sometimes our Christianity can be so much about doing things for God that we simply forget to be with God. To be with God on the way to work, to bring God into everyday decisions, to do something you love with God, to take a walk and simply enjoy God. And I think, like, for some reason, like, when it comes to God, it's like, ah, that's weird, though. What do you mean, like, bring him into all my decisions? Like, you know, I don't want to be talking to myself, like, in the car. Like, he's not really there in person. We do it all the time. We do it on our phones. We talk to people that don't exist all the time, that we don't see with our eyes. What would it look like to become consciously aware that God is with us everywhere we go. I think we all always think that being in the presence of God has to mean we're like on our knees praying. And yes, there is a place and a purpose for that, but I like to think of that a lot more like a person's anniversary or a date night or a birthday, these moments that you set aside. But the, the, the strength of those moments can only be dependent on how much time you spend in that relationship outside of those days. It would be very awkward, strange anniversary dinner if you go out for your anniversary and you have spent no time with your spouse whatsoever. And yet often this is characteristic of our relationship with God. Abiding in God is acknowledging His presence everywhere we go. And if we're honest with ourselves, I think so much of our relationship with God has become so transactional. We talk to him only when we need something from him or when something isn't going right. We're always approaching God with an agenda. Abiding has no agenda. It's being with God for the sake of being with him. You know, I, I realized that I had, to, I had to call my parents more because I remember, you know, there was a season when, like, I would call my mom and she would pick up the phone like, are you okay? What do you need? What's wrong? And I was like, oh, no, no, no. It's just, just calling just because. She's like, are you sure? And I realized, like, so much of how we relate to God is like that. Something dire has to happen in our lives, and then we're like, we get the whole community to pray for us. We're on our knees. We're praying. It's like, when's the last time you were just unproductive with God? When you called God, and, and God was like, what's up? And you're like, Nothing. What's up? Now, how do you know you're abiding? Because abiding still can be like kind of nebulous, right? And I think 
Jesus tells us, Jesus says, abiding produces fruit. He says, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. He says, the longer you hang out with me, the more your life will start to look like me. And it's interesting, the Apostle Paul used the same word for fruit found here in John 15 and Galatians 5 when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. In other words, Jesus is saying, you will know you're connected to the vine. You will know you're connected to the life source that is me if your life begins to emanate these qualities. Love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth. And Jesus isn't just talking about behavior because we can all act loving for a day. We can all act kind and joyful for a moment. Jesus isn't talking about behavior modification. He's talking about an inward transformation of the heart that makes us into people of love, people of joy, people of peace. You know, like if you, right now, like our staff, we're really close. We have great relationships. And if you asked our staff to imitate each other, we could. Right? Because, you know, everyone has very distinct mannerisms. And so, you know, if you told me to imitate anyone on our staff, I probably could. Now, with that said, now we've actually spent so much time together, working together, that people in our community are telling us we actually are starting to talk alike. We actually are starting to have similar mannerisms. And that's actually not us trying to imitate each other. That's the byproduct of spending so much time together, right? This is why spouses often start to, like, say the same things, speak in the same way. They all sometimes even start to look like each other because it's the byproduct of hanging out a lot. Being Christian is so much more than a label. It's a way of life. And if your life is not producing the fruit you desire, perhaps it has something to do with who or what you're connected to, who or what you're abiding in. If you're connected to a toxic relationship, your life will emanate toxicity. It will. If you are connected to social media 24-7, your life will start to look like walking curated performance art. If you are connected to Twitter 24-7, your life will start to look like your Twitter feed. You will start to be so mad and hate everyone who disagrees with your views. If you're connected to your Robinhood account or Coinbase 24-7, you will start to look like it. Your mood will swing as the market swings. So I'm sure some of you have really bad moods right now. Who or what you are connected to will alter the quality of your life. And as Christians, I think there's sometimes such a dissonance because we say we go to church, I serve, I see other Christians, but how come my life doesn't look, smell, and feel like Jesus? How come I don't feel more at peace? Why am I so anxious? Why am I still lashing out? Why am I so impatient? Why am I so mean to my kids? There's the famous quote that your system is perfectly designed to give you the results you're getting. Your life is the byproduct of your lifestyle. Being Christian is so much more than a label. It's a way of life. Well, if this is true, how do we learn to abide in the vine? I don't know anyone here who would not desire life marked by more love, more peace, more joy, and more patience. So it's like, how do I have access to that life? How do we learn to abide in Jesus so that we can become more like him? And I think this text gives us two ways, through pace and through pain, okay? Through pace and through pain. First, through pace. You know, the word abide is kind of a foreign word to us because the concept of staying anywhere or remaining anywhere for a long period of time is a foreign concept to those of us who live in L.A. in 2022. Our lives are go, 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 do, 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 achieve this, accomplish that. Most people don't even stay in L.A. for the, longer than two years. It's so hard to do ministry here because the moment you get close to someone, they're gone. The idea of abiding 
is just so foreign to us because we always have something to do, somewhere to go. And this is why the pandemic was so devastating to us, especially in the beginning, because everything stopped. No more concerts, no more sporting events. All of our events were gone. We had nowhere to go, no one to see. And all of us experienced some level of withdrawal, right? You know, when something like feels so normal, you almost have to be taken out of that normal in order to see how abnormal your life was. You know, sometimes like you don't realize how toxic your work situation is or your company is until you go and work for a different company that gives you a much better work-life balance. And you're like, oh my goodness, that was traumatic where I was before. I feel like that's what the pandemic was for a lot of us. And now, I mean, it's sad to see it, but we're all kind of going back. Like, I know I speak for myself. Things are just busy again. Things are hurried again. And right now, I don't think many of us realize that we're running at a pace that makes abiding in Jesus nearly impossible. But see, it takes time for plants to bear fruit. It takes time. They need to be tended. They need to be watered. They need to be constantly connected to their source of life. Branches do not bear fruit overnight. This is why they have to abide. It's a slow process. But see, our culture doesn't train us to slow down, right? It trains us to speed up. Do, 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 go, 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 right? This is why the philosopher Dallas Willard once said, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. Corey Ten Boom said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Because both sin and busyness have the exact same effect. They cut off your connection to God, to other people, and even to your own soul. You know, many of you know, uh, we just finished a book club on the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, amazing book by John Mark Comer. And he says, hurry is violence to the soul. In order to learn to abide, we first have to learn to slow our pace. That email you have to write will still be there tomorrow. That thing that right now you're getting antsy, even sitting here, you know you have to do right after church, don't worry, your life is not going to end. It's still going to be there tomorrow. Because busyness and hurry come so naturally for us, we actually have to intentionally carve out space to slow down and abide, to turn off, to disconnect, to go for a walk, and be unproductive with God. This is what's training our hearts to abide. So number one, we need to change the pace. Second way we learn to abide, and this one sucks, but it's through pain. And this is not easy. Um, and this is not to say God brings pain into your life, but if God's desire is for you to become a fruit-bearing plant, then he will use anything at his disposal, even pain, to bring that about. Sometimes if you don't slow down, God will slow you down. If you don't humble yourself, God will humble you. That's why I never pray, God, humble me. I just try to humble myself. It's a horrible prayer, right? In verse 2, we read that every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. And the Greek word translated take away is the word ira, which also can be translated to lift up. Isn't that interesting? It can be translated take away and lift up, that sometimes what feels like God is taking away can be God lifting us up so that we can bear fruit. Sometimes we lose someone or something we love and cherish deeply, and we can feel angry because we say, God, why would you take that thing away from me? Why would you take that job away from me? Why would you take that relationship or that friendship away from me? And it feels like God is taking us away from the things that are good in our lives. But you see, God doesn't want us to abide in anything other than him. So often he will use these moments when we feel like we're losing the thing we love most in order to draw near to us and show us that the only one we really need is him. But the second part of that verse is also really interesting. It says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Do you ever feel like pain like, comes in the worst possible moments? Right? Things start to feel like, okay, I'm, I'm finding a good rhythm. You know, I feel like things are good with my parents. 
feel like things are good with my spouse for the first time in a long time. I feel like we're hitting a, a nice stride. I feel like I'm reconnecting with the community. I feel like my spiritual life is actually move on, on, on an upward trajectory. And then all of a sudden, one thing happens and we're back in the darkness. One conversation, we're triggered back in the darkness. And it's like, what, what are you doing? What is that? And yet God says, for those bearing fruit, he prunes so that they can bear more fruit. And it's so frustrating because you start to feel like, I'm growing, I'm maturing. What is going on? And, you know, if you've ever seen a vine dresser prune a vine, you can go look it up on YouTube. It looks horrible. Like, it literally looks like they're tearing the vine to shreds. Because they're just cutting things away. They're, they're, they're massacring it. And it's like, what are you doing? But every vine dresser knows his vine intimately and knows what to do in order to maximize fruit. And I think there are seasons in our lives when we see God coming at us with shears and we're like, no, 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 no. What are you doing, God? Those are sharp. What are you trying to take away? What are you telling me to do? Not realizing that God knows us intimately and he knows what needs to be taken away and knows what needs to be cut out of our lives to produce maximum fruit i talk to people in our community every week who've experienced tragic loss over the past couple of years and obviously they don't always see it in the moment but in hindsight without a doubt they will always talk about how god used that season to expand their heart to grow their empathy, love, and compassion for those around them so that they could be a more beautiful embodiment of Jesus to their community. And this is not to minimize or dismiss what anyone is going through right now, but, I, but let this be a word of comfort to you that what you may feel like just a massacre can actually be God pruning you. Can God be helping you? God be building you up, lifting you up so that you can bear maximum fruit now let me close by saying this what i think is really great about this passage is that anything jesus says about his relationship to his disciples he connects first to his relationship with the father he says as the father has loved me so have i loved you abide in my love notice the order the father loves me so have i loved you now you come abide in my love and that order is so important because when Jesus says, abide in me, he's not telling us to come find him. He's saying, I've been waiting. I'm already here. I just want you to know that I've already been waiting for you. Before we wanted to be with him, Jesus wanted to be with us. Before he wanted to, we wanted to make ourselves home with him, he chose to make himself at home with us at the beginning of the gospel of john we read that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us he came to be with his people and nobody lived a more fruitful life than jesus but you see for jesus when the knife came close it was not to prune him but to pierce him and on the cross the source of all life was massacred and destroyed why so that you and I, who were dead in the water, would be lifted up and reconnected to the vine in order that we might bear fruit and have life to the full. This is the gospel. You know, um, my daughter Avery, who's about to turn seven, she's been having, like, night terrors these days. It's like, it's a freaky thing. I was going to actually show a video of it, but I didn't want to scare you. It's actually like, it's like exorcist level, okay? And, um, you know, it's like, it's so scary that, like, before bed now, she makes um, me and Carol pray for her twice, that she doesn't have scary dreams or scary thoughts, okay? And she's always saying, like, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to have scary thoughts again. And so, like, in the middle of the night, she'll just literally wake up screaming bloody murder. And, you know, Carol and I will rush into the room. We'll grab her. I mean, her arms are flailing. She, it's almost like sleepwalking, so she doesn't really know what's going on. And she's just screaming like, I want mommy, I want mommy, I want mommy. And Carol is trying to hold her down, hold her arms down. She's like, 
like jumping up and down the bed. I know it's scary, but like, and we're trying to hold her down in place. And she's like, I want mommy, I want mommy, I want mommy. And the thing that Carol always says over and over again is, mommy's here. Mommy's here. Like, wake up, mommy's here. And that goes on for a long time because she's, she, she, wants, she knows there's something she's deeply longing for, not realizing that her mom is there. Her mom has always been there. And so there's a moment of consciousness that comes through when all of a sudden she realizes, okay, like, like Carol's holding her. And then over time, it takes a while. Sometimes this process is like an hour. And it takes a while, but you can feel her heart start beating slowly. You can feel her breathing start to get slower. You can start to see her arms and body and muscles relax. And then slowly but surely, she falls asleep. And I realize is that this is what abiding in the vine looks like. It's not about us doing anything. It's about us simply resting in God's loving embrace. And as a church, you know, I know that like so many of us, because we grew up in churches where like God was so conflated with duty and things that we had to do, God became this like demanding tyrant. I think we don't know. We've lost the art of simply resting in the Father's embrace. And so today, as we close, I want to encourage us, whatever you're going through, if you feel here and you're sitting here and you feel anxious or like things are just not right with your soul and you feel like you're just flailing your arms around, you're screaming out, I just want you to know that Jesus is there. He's always been there. And so he says, abide in me as I abide in you. Abide in my love. Let's pray. I want us to take a moment and just sit in silence. For us to just sit with God. To simply be with him as a daughter, as a son. To sit with him simply knowing we're loved, we're seen, we're deeply cherished. as a way to close, I'd like to read this uh, prayer that I adapted from St. Patrick. That these words would resonate in our souls even as we sit here in this place. I abide today through the strength of heaven, light of the sun, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of the wind, depth of the sea, stability of the earth, firmness of the rock. I abide today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's hosts to save me afar and anear, alone or in a multitude. Christ, shield me today against wounding. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left. 
Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in the ear that hears me. I abide today through the mighty strength of the Lord of creation. Amen. Amen. If you're able, I'm going to invite us to stand. Our time of praise and singing is actually an opportunity for us to abide, to sit with God with no agenda and simply be reminded of the truths that he promises over us. Let's take this time to worship.
Thanks so much for joining us for worship today. Uh, before I give the benediction, uh, I do want to say, again, if you're new, visiting for the first time, we'd love to uh, connect with you um, outside as we fellowship. Um, for parents, there's a, an elementary fun lunch happening uh, right here after the service, so uh, definitely don't miss out on that. Um, and also, if you could help us greatly, um, right after the service, you could grab the chair that you're sitting on and help us rack them on my left and my right. Uh, that would help our hospitality team greatly. With that, please remain standing for the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Heavenly Father and the sweet abiding fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Have a great week, everyone.